I'm enjoying it very much. I'm seeing many people working in many areas and giving a good use for the exo athlete exoskeleton and learning a lot from uh, clinical partners as well as scientific partners. I'm developing a, a rehabilitation program which is to test and improve a previous rehabilitation program. This includes virtual reality, tactile feedback, thermal feedback and the use of an exoskeleton. I haven't yet started using the exoskeleton. I plan to start using it in January 2020. I think it's an amazing competition and I would be very glad to bring people to compete on it and to see more people competing. Actually, I would even like to propose to see if it would be possible to do it for also for children. I think they would have great fun doing it. I think there is a huge potential. I think we're just at the beginning because very soon we'll learn that we can do a lot more and I think it will be almost like a cell phone. I think almost everyone will have one uh, in one way or another to compensate or to help or to mitigate possible health problems or things that we know that appear with time. So it, I, I think it will be not only for clinical applications but for day-to-day -day applications. I think probably in the future there will be a mix of hard and soft exoskeletons or maybe something some material that we don't even know, some sort of biomaterial that can connect them. But uh, so far, I think there will be very interesting things coming together from both parts. So I think we, we can learn in both cases uh, important things. One of the things I'm doing is to develop a tactile and thermal feedback. So one thing I would like to do is to add it to the exoskeleton and see how it works. And uh, as for cloud technologies, one of the things we're we would like to improve is how we're decoding information from the brain. So we're trying for the brain to control the exoskeleton, not just a manual control. And it would be really important for us to have a really good decoding of what's going on in the brain. And I think cloud technologies will help us a lot on this. I'd very much like to do that because I think children are, uh, can adapt a lot easier than us to many things. So it would be very easy for them to adapt. And the second thing is that they're developing. So, for example, I learned today that using exoskeletons in um, multiple sclerosis patients can actually help preserve cognitive uh, status. So, I also imagine that if we have children with disabilities and they start using exoskeletons very early, they probably can develop their cognitive potential to a further extent or more than what was expected. This is not yet tested, but I, I would really like to test this. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you for the invitation. I'll be talking about a rehabilitation program that we're developing. Uh, basically, uh, my approach is that it's all about inputs and outputs. And I st I'll start by telling you a little bit about my background and on inputs to the brain. So one of the things I did in the past was to have two rats and we're recording activity from motor cortex of one rat while he's doing a task. And he needs to press a lever. If he presses that lever, he gets water, okay? We record this activity and we send it through the internet to the brain of a second rat. And this rat now needs to perform the exact same task. So information goes from one brain and goes to the other brain and the other brain needs to do the exact same thing. So you'll see the rat over there on the left. He's gonna see two lights. Okay, this is the cells firing. He needs to press that lever. He got it. Gets water. Information goes to the brain of this animal. He needs to choose. He doesn't know which one. He needs to use brain information and selects the left side. And now we're going to do the same thing for the right side. So the rat will see a light on the right side. We record neural information. You'll see the tactile, the motor stimulation is going to move a little bit right there. It's thinking and now eventually it decides to go to the right side. This is just to show you, this is certainly not uh, telepathy, this is just decoding neural activity and encoding it as electrical stimulation on another side. So it's about outputs from one brain and sending inputs to another brain. So in a non-pathological situation, you have information passing from one place to the other. And in lesions, sorry about the Portuguese part, but I think you can understand the image. 
you have a lesion and somehow you cannot pass this information. And so you use a brain machine interface where you try to do a bypass of this. And basically what you do is you find a new route to send information and you try to have some sort of mechanism compensating for the function you don't have. Of course, you know where this is going and this is an example of invasive uh, recording and what you get is that you can extract outputs from the brain and control machines with them. Now, in a further advance, uh, in the lab where I was working, and this is not my work now, they thought, well, we're listening to the brain, we're extracting outputs, but maybe one thing we can do is to actually send inputs to the brain by giving little bits of stimulation. And when they started to do this, this monkey was now controlling a virtual avatar that was moving, and when the avatar passed in each of these uh, targets, it would receive stimulation in the brain. And what this means is that it would be the same as touching different textures, okay? And what was interesting was that when the animal had tactile feedback, uh, it, was, it learned about 10 times faster than the usual. And this is simple for you to understand. If I close my eyes and I try to grab something, it will not be perfect. But if I'm looking and I'm going there, it's gonna be very perfect because at every moment I'm controlling what I'm doing and I can make my trajectory very perfect. So we can listen to the brain and to its outputs and now we can generate inputs by giving feedback. And these inputs will improve performance. Now, one thing that you can say is, well, are you just building a very, very, very expensive crutch or do I actually get neuroplasticity? Do I get some effect? So I think you'll hear uh, Mikhail Lebedev speaking in a few moments. I worked with him at Duke and with Professor Nicole Ellis and they have developed, while well, I was doing the rat part and the monkey stuff, they were developing this rehabilitation program. And they have a patient with spinal cord lesion that starts by doing virtual reality training, sitting, then standing, then with assisted gait, eventually with an exoskeleton, and then controlling with EEG the exoskeleton. So brain activity will now control the exoskeleton. And there's one more thing here, which is every time that the exoskeleton steps on the floor, the patients get to feel that exact moment on their forearms. So this gives them a notion of what's going on with their feet, even if the lesion does not allow them to feel. And what happens when you do this is that they start to, they start to have phantom limb with no pain, but they have phantom limb experience, and they say, I just felt like I was touching the floor. I felt my legs again. And another thing is that the way in which you stimulate the forearm you know, if you increase the frequency or decrease, etc., they will say, I feel like I'm walking on grass. And if you change it, they say, I feel like I'm walking on sand or I'm walking on stone. So we looked at this and we said, well, let's do two things. First, can we reproduce this? You know, they showed improvements and this is fantastic. And we said, okay, first of all, this is so much technology. Show me you can do it. And second, can we somehow improve this protocol? So uh, in my school, we also have a school of arts. And when they looked at virtual reality, they said, well, we, we work with uh, gaming, we make games, so we can make our virtual reality slightly different and more dynamic. And we can also make virtual reality for sound, so we can make the sounds of grass and sand, etc. So what we want to do is to improve virtual reality with vision and sound, also improve the tactile and thermal feedback. We believe that the sense of body ownership might take a very big part in all of this. So we'll have constant psychological evaluation and of course the exoskeleton being controlled and jointly with the tactile and thermal stimulation. So this is an example of what we, the scenario that we're planning to use. And you see that we have grass and sand and stone all mixed. So the idea is that this richer effect may help improve neural plasticity. We'll test this, we'll see. 
Now, we have developed, I can't show you because we're submitting this for a patent, but we have developed a tactile and a thermal sleeve where we can deliver multiple patterns, either alone or combined, to reproduce what's going on in the virtual reality and in the real world. You can see here that, and these are now uh, preliminary data, of course, we'll need to have a lot more uh, in the future. And what I would like to make clear here is that, you know, we could just record and try to find a significant p-value and say, look, gamma, gamma band is different, so this is important. Okay, that's not the goal. Our goal is if we can actually understand what is encoded in temperature, is it temperature, is it pleasantness, is it difference versus the previous temperature? For example, if it's very cold and I give you warm water, you'll say that it's, you're getting a burn and you're not. Okay, it's just a contrast. So part of the, what seems to be important here is pleasantness. Why? Because this will probably take a huge role in you accepting the tactile stimulation that you're receiving and in body ownership. So this, you can see here, this is for one subject, differences in temperature and with tactile, okay? And we also have them for different temperatures and multiple subjects. And interesting things that we saw was that within the same subject, you can usually distinguish between the different temperatures, but not yet for uh, groups of subjects. So this is not yet clear. Of course, you can tell me, well, there are lots of studies showing that you've got specific frequencies and etc. Yes, but this is EEG. So with EEG, I first need to see it. And it doesn't mean that the other studies are not correct. It just means that there's so much variability that for you to find uh, the same result, it's going to be hard. Um, so we can certainly see in the same subject differences in the power. This is gamma. Um, but not so much for groups at this moment. So we looked for another way of analyzing this, and if it gets a bit complicated, don't worry. But the, the idea is to ask, how much more do we have in here than in, in another part, okay? So we build a ratio with these frequencies, and then we calculate another ratio with the lower frequencies, and then we, got, we get them together and we build a map, okay? And then we can start asking things about the different temperatures and what do they represent or not. But now it's in two dimensions instead of one dimension. So we can start asking, what is the distance between each one of these dots and the temperature 37 degrees, which is considered neutral here? And so when we start to analyze this, we see an interesting pattern, which we still need to analyze in more detail, but there seems to be a sort of constant distance to the neutral temperature, meaning that hot or cold temperature tend to be at a specific distance, okay? We are gonna correlate this with the pleasantness of the experience to um, see exactly how they fit or not. There's one thing I haven't mentioned to you, which is in these stages, we are also looking for one other thing, which is when you look, when you hear about brain machine interfaces, it's always about you have brain activity and now you control a machine. And I think, uh, and you can disagree on this, I think there's a big role for another thing that typically people do not consider. When we talk about brain and you say, okay, the brain is constituted typically by two types of cells, by neurons and glia. And glia cells or, gli or glial cells do have an important role, for example, in glutamate and in all the neurochemistry. So one thing we're gonna do is whenever a new phase starts and in baseline, we're gonna collect saliva samples and do protein profile. Because what we want to know is, for example, if a specific protein profile is prone to chronic pain or because it's been shown that certain types of EEG activity and certain types of clinical history seem to be associated with development of chronic pain. So we would like to explore that and see if, for example, encoding in the brain is different and meaning the, the, your ability for neuroplasticity or your ability to adapt to a specific technology. So 
we looked mostly at the regions associated with somatosensory cortex, but we want to explore uh, the topographic map and contralateral regions. And also, we will try to use near infrared spectroscopy, which gives us a signal similar somehow to the res um, magnetic resonance. What this means is that we can go for subcortical regions and get an idea of what's going on. Uh, we hope that basic science will do its role here and help us understand how is neuroplasticity being triggered in this case. So we plan to start using the exoskeleton in January 2020. I would say next Monday, but let's say January 2020. And having a good mechanistic uh, knowledge of this should probably help us. Conclusions. We are going to use visual and auditory virtual reality combined with a brain control exoskeleton receiving tactile and thermal feedback. This uh, feedback will be mapped to the subject's forearms. The thermal and tactile sleeve is working. We want to figure out the details to know exactly what we're doing. And EEG analysis suggests that EEG, uh, sorry, temperature may be encoded in specific ratios and frequency bands. As you can imagine, this is the work of many people, not just me, so I should thank them, and also Exoathlete for the invitation. Thank you very much. <laughs>